On the site of a Dark Age Pictish fort on the shores of Loch Ness is a ruined castle with the remains of a five-story medieval tower. It was the site of many battles and was captured by Edward Longshanks, Robert the Bruce, and the site of a great raid by the McDonald's. This is James from History of Victorum. Join us as we explore the castle of Urquhart. On a picturesque area above Loch Ness, Urquhart was built along important trade routes, and a fortification here existed at least as early as the 6th century. The ruin we can see today dates from the mid to early 13th century. The gatehouse of Urquhart was constructed in the late 13th century by the Comyn family. The Comyns were a powerful family who were considered for the Scottish throne and were rivals of Robert the Bruce. The gatehouse would have been protected by a moat along with a barred portcullis like this one at Edinburgh Castle with two strong wooden doors after that. Originally the gatehouse would have been several stories tall and would have probably resembled this one in Wales called Harlot Castle which was built around the same time. Much of the gatehouse was destroyed to prevent it from being used in the Jacobite rebellions in 1695 and remains of the upper stories can still be seen here on the grass. Two floors are still visible. The bottom floor housed a small prison and a living area, which was later converted to a kiln house that was used to dry and store corn. The upper floor would have been the constable's quarters. The constable was in charge of the castle and its affairs when the lord was not in residence. We can still see the remains of a toilet and a fireplace. The castle was captured in 1296 by Edward I known as Edward Longshanks or Hammer of the Scots. This trebuchet is a reconstruction of a weapon that Edward would have used at the time. Stone balls used for catapult ammunition were found on the site of Urquhart. Robert de Bruce captured the castle in 1307 and defeated his rival, the Comyns, in battle. This large tower was built in the early to mid 16th century replacing an earlier tower. The tower was five stories tall with the entrance to the second story. All the stories are still visible. The south wall is said to have collapsed during a great storm of wind in February 1715. Entering in the second story is a hall with a fireplace which was used as a reception room and partially for dining. The third floor was a chamber for the Lord and Lady to relax and dine, and the fourth floor was likely the Lord and Lady's bedchamber, which would also have been a reception room. The upper floor had several small chambers, each with a fireplace probably for other family members. These stairs here lead down to the basement, which is part of the older tower structure and was used for storage. Looking outwards from the tower, we can see the remains of the former Great Hall, built around the year 1300, as well as great kitchens and the former chambers. The Great Hall would have been this rectangular building in the center, and the building furthest away was the Great Kitchen, and the one closest to us would have been the Great Chamber where the Lord and Lady had private chambers. These structures fell into disuse around the time this new tower was built, possibly due to raids from the McDonald's and other instability and the chambers and living areas were moved to the tower. Traces of medieval life were found on the site, including the pot shown here from the 15th century and bone gaming pieces that were from a medieval game similar to backgammon. There are a couple of other ruined structures around the area. Difficult to say what these were exactly, but one of them could have been a chapel and another could have been a newer kitchen area that was used when the residents moved to the tower. Heading further from the tower, we have the remains of a dovecot which was used for keeping pigeons or doves. These were used for meat and eggs, especially during the winter months. Although much of the structure no longer exists today, we can still see four stone boxes remaining where the pigeons could have their nests. 
The forest around Urquhart was known for being one of the best hunting areas in Scotland, so other hunting would have included deer and boar outside of the castle walls. On the grounds outside of the castle would have been a settlement or castle town. This would have had houses, workshops, tanners, woodcutters, metalworkers. To give you an idea of how large of an area was controlled by the castle, we have a detailed account of what was taken during a great raid in 1545 by Clan MacDonald. The MacDonalds controlled a large amount of territory to the west and were known as the Lords of the Isles. Some items taken during the raid include over 3,000 sheep, 2,000 cattle, about 400 horses, 64 geese, a large amount of oats and barley, and three boats, amongst other items. On this highest point in the castle, there was once a Dark Age Pictish fort. Around the year 580, St. Columba set on a journey from the island of Iona in the southwest to visit Bride, King of the Picts. Radiocarbon dates the site to around 500 AD and an elaborate Pictish brooch was found nearby, so this was likely an important Pictish site. Some have suggested that Bride's fortification was here at Urquhart, but it's more likely that it was located at Inverness. In an account of the life of St. Columba, written in the 7th century, it's written that he stopped at a place called Ercarton, which is very likely Urquhart. A Pictish nobleman of the name of Emka was the lord here at the time, and St. Columba baptized him and his family. This path leads to the water gate, and it allowed passage to the castle from the lock below. In medieval times, Traveling by boat would have been a very important method of transportation and was much easier than going through land in most cases. And St. Columba may have taken this route in his journey to see King Bride. Also in the life of St. Columba, on his way to visit King Bride, it's written that he came upon a water beast in the river Ness. He banished it away by raising his hands and making the sign of the cross in the air which is one of the earliest sources for the myth of the Loch Ness Monster. Near the water gate is another set of structures which would likely have been a smithy. Feel free to check out our other videos here and thank you for joining History Victorum as we explore the castle of Urquhart.